Welcome back. The ACT math section is, I'm sorry to say, a little unfair. The reason why is that the test makers are always shifting what topics are considered fair game. You might find that this is particularly relevant to you if your score is hovering right around the 30 mark and you can't quite earn those last few points to push you over the edge. In video six, here, I talked about how a four point jump from a 19 to a 23 is much more doable than the same four point jump from a 29 to a 33. Why? One reason is the curve. The top of the scoring curve will penalize you much more. If you miss even just two of the questions at the end, you might lose up to four points. That's very harsh, and that doesn't happen in the middle of the curve. But there's another reason why those last few points might be so difficult to earn. The questions at the end of an ACT math section aren't just pulling from the harder topics, they are pulling from the more random topics. Here's the comparison I often like to make with my students. There's a great scene in the book 1984, which, by the way, is right there. At that scene, a man is on stage at a political rally shouting to the crowd about how they are at war with Eurasia, and the crowd is going nuts. But in the middle of the speech, someone walks on stage, passes him a note, he reads it, and mid-sentence without breaking stride, he starts shouting how they are now at war with East Asia. Eurasia, who was just their enemy, is now their ally and the people in the crowd just go with it. And that's kind of what it's like at the end of an ACT math section. Okay, maybe that's a little dark, but that analogy is not far off. The topics that are in play one year are suddenly not in play the next year. There is no standard list of topics that are considered fair game. It changes from test to test. So in this video, let's talk about some of the more elusive ACT math topics and some that have only recently crept onto the test. These topics might give you the bump you need to turn a good score into a great score. So if you find this video helpful, please hit that like button. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Okay, let's unpack some of the more random ACT math questions and try to make the test a little less unfair. Before we start, I just want to say that this video is going to be a little rapid fire. Usually, I spend more time on the actual mechanics of a question and the step-by-step -step process of how to isolate a variable. This video is the graduate course. <laughs> I want to cover as many topics as possible, so I'm not going to dwell too much on step-by-step -step computation. So if you need help with any of the fundamentals, check out my math playlist. There's a lot of great stuff there. But if you do have any questions on anything that I cover here, please leave a comment down below. Let's start with some formulas. Again, the ACT is inconsistent. Sometimes they will define a certain rule or formula for you. Other times they won't. Let's look at a few now. Grab a pencil and paper and take notes as needed. Here are some topics that the ACT will sometimes define for you. Press pause and fill out the ones that you can. Here are the answers. Again, I'm just gonna zip through these, jot down any as needed. You might need to know volume of a cylinder or a prism, area of a trapezoid, the definitions of an arithmetic sequence versus a geometric sequence, and the quadratic formula. Now just to talk about those last few for a moment. Five with an exclamation point doesn't mean to shout the number five. It means five factorial. You multiply by every number less than five. Five times four times three times two times one. We're going to need that in a few minutes on an upcoming question. Also, the determinant of a matrix is found by crisscrossing the products and then subtracting. So in this case, AD minus BC. I covered matrices in much more detail in my video here. Check it out. That video has a lot of moving parts and it's very popular on the ACT. And for the law of sines and the law of cosines, well, we'll get to those in a moment. Again, what do these topics all have in common? They're not only very popular on the ACT, they are topics that the test will only sometimes define for you. In other words, on any given test, they might tell you the volume of a cylinder, but then on the next test, they don't. So, as you take practice tests, be sure to jot down any rule, formula, or definition that you come across. I recommend making flashcards. Just because they define it on one test doesn't mean that they will on another. The ACT is annoying that way. Okay, let's get to some of the heavier lifting. We'll start with the law of sines and the law of cosines. Again, sometimes the test will give you the law of sines or the law of cosines when you need to know them on a question, but other times they won't. Here they are. In this picture, the law of sines states sine of a over a 
equals sine of b over b equals sine of c over c. And notice those capital letters versus the lowercase letters. Capital A means the angle, and then the little a means the side that it opens to, or its corresponding side. Same with the b and the b, and the c with the c. And the same is true for the law of cosines. a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. And again, the big A means the angle, and the small a means the side that it opens to. So let's see how these can come up on a question. In the figure above, angle C is 37 degrees and angle B is 52 degrees. If B equals 83, come up with an expression to solve for C. I'll give you a minute. Press pause and try to use one of those formulas to solve. So let's start by labeling what the question tells us. Angle C is 37 degrees, angle B is 52, and side B is 83. So of the two formulas, we want to use the law of sines. The reason why is that we have two of the angles we need and one of the sides, and the question's asking for the other side. So if we use the law of sines, we would have three out of four parts of that proportion, and then we could isolate the missing piece. Let's see how. So using the law of sines, we just need the sine of B over B equals the sine of C over C. Don't worry about the A's. And then plugging in the information they give us, sine of 52 over 83 equals the sine of 37 over C. Then you can cross multiply and isolate C. Isolating C would give you 83 sine 37 over the sine of 52. And that's it. That's the answer. Notice they don't want a numeric answer. That's not the point of these questions. They just want you to set up an equation with the law of sines and then manipulate that formula. And the same thing goes for the law of cosines. Check out my video 16 here where I cover some great math tricks. In that video, I cover a similar example with the law of cosines. Plus, I hit some other great ACT topics, like repeating sequences and how to cheat your way around a question if old-fashioned algebra fails. Check it out. But finish this video first. Here's another topic that's become more popular on the ACT over the last year or two. Let's start easy, then we'll get harder. What is the probability of rolling a five on a six-sided die and flipping a head on a fair coin? And then the next one, what is the probability of rolling a five or flipping a head on a fair coin? Notice the words in bold here, and versus r. Those each mean different math steps. If they want the probability of a and b, that means that you multiply the given probabilities. So the probability of rolling a five would be one-sixth, and then the probability of flipping a head is one-half. Multiplying that would give us 1 over 12. But if they say or, it means we need to add those probabilities. 1 6 plus 1 half. Getting common denominators would ultimately give us 4 over 6, or 2 thirds. So, when finding the probability of two events happening together, and means to multiply the probabilities, and or means to add the probabilities. And that's going to be a very important underlying theme for the next two questions. When they want to know how different events might happen consecutively, it's all about multiplying the possibilities. Let's see how this appears on some harder questions. You have five pairs of pants, seven shirts, and nine hats. If you're going to wear one of each, how many outfit combinations are possible? We could do this the long way with a tree diagram. In other words, you could draw out five pairs of pants and then from each one have seven branches come off for the shirts, and then from those, nine more from each one for the hats. But don't do that, it would take a very long time. All you have to do is multiply these numbers. Five times seven times nine. The answer is 315. And this is called the counting principle. So, for the counting principle, find the total number of outcomes by multiplying the possibilities. So, for example, let's just say that you go to a restaurant and you have the choice of, I don't know, four appetizers, six entrees, and 12 desserts. You would, what did I say? I forgot the numbers. Four times six times 12. Those were the numbers, right? Let's just say that those were the numbers. Who cares? The point is you multiply the numbers. Let's make this a little more challenging. Your new password for an online shopping account consists of two letters and two numbers. If you may repeat letters and numbers, how many passwords are possible? So just like we did on the previous example, you want to start by listing out the possibilities. That would be four blank spaces, two letters, two numbers. The question becomes, how many possibilities can go in each spot? Well, how many letters are there? 26. I won't make a count. And how many digits are there? Some of my students like to say infinite. 
There aren't infinite digits, there are only so many digits that we could use to build numbers. Others like to tell me nine, I say one through nine. But don't forget about zero. Zero through nine, they're actually 10 digits. So if we have 26 letters and 10 digits, what would go in each spot? For the first two letters, it would be 26 and 26, and then for the digits, 10 and 10. The final answer is 26 times 26 times 10 times 10. And just like that trigonometry question, they don't want a numeric answer. The answer might be listed as just 26, 26, 10, 10. It's all about multiplying the possibilities. But now let's look at a variation where they give you a restriction. Your new password for an online shopping account consists of two letters and two numbers. If you may not repeat letters and numbers, how many passwords are possible? Notice that word here, may not repeat. I'll give you a minute. Press pause, give it a shot. So just like the previous example, you want to list out four blank spots to visualize the different possibilities. And just like the last example, that first spot would have 26, 26 letters. But if you can't repeat terms, that means the next spot would no longer be 26. Since you already picked a letter, it would have to go down. You only have 25 possibilities. And now same thing for the digits. 10 possibilities, but then you can't use that digit again, so then it would be 9. The final answer would be 26 times 25 times 10 times 9. So the same principle is in play from the previous question. You just have to be very careful if they give you a restriction. Let's look at another variation. Five friends are going to the movies. In how many ways can they be arranged in five seats? Just like on the last example, we want to visualize the possibilities. So you can draw five blank spots. Now the question becomes, how many possibilities do we have in each spot? Well, we have five friends who can go in the first seat. So that first spot, we get a five. But once a friend goes there, we can't use that friend again. The numbers would go down. So the second spot would actually be four possibilities. And then so on, three, two, one. The answer is five times four times three times two times one. And this is what we saw, the factorial symbol, five factorial. So in order to determine how many ways n items can be arranged, use n factorial. So for example, let's say that you have, I don't know, six pictures that you want to put in six different spots on the counter, and how many ways could they be arranged? It would be six factorial. Six times five times four times three times two times one. But now let's kick it up a notch and give it another restriction. The same five friends go to the movies. However, Doug is the tallest, so he must take the aisle seat. If Doug takes the aisle seat, in how many ways can all five friends be arranged in their seats? I'll give you a minute. Press pause. Give it a try. So if you can visualize five blank spaces, think about the numbers that would go in each spot. Doug must take the aisle seat, so that first seat is no longer five possibilities. Now it's one possibility. Doug has to go there. And then once Doug is there, the rest of the numbers would be the same. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. It would be 1 times 4, 3, 2, 1. So the big theme of the arrangement questions is to always multiply the possibilities. You just need to be very careful about the terms and whether or not they can repeat. Again, these arrangement questions have become a particular favorite on the ACT over the last year or two. The ACT also likes to include questions on graphs and conic sections. Many of them are standard fare. You'll definitely see the following equations in play on your test. The equation of a line, equations of parabolas in both standard form and vertex form, and the equations for a circle centered at the origin and not centered at the origin. Again, I don't want to dwell on them here. Take notes on any as needed. But in the last year or two, a few other conic sections have crept their way into the test. One of them is the equation for an ellipse. You could have an ellipse centered at the origin or not centered at the origin. We'll get to all these details in a moment on a question. And if they really want to be mean, they can also throw in the equation of a hyperbola. The equation for a hyperbola is very similar for the equation for an ellipse, but you're subtracting the fractions instead of adding them. Now, I know that seems like a lot of random data thrown at you, so let's slow down and talk about what these formulas mean in the context of a question. What are the center and radii of this ellipse? So let's go back a step. What is an ellipse? It's sort of like a stretched out circle. In a circle, your radius is always the same, no matter where you are, but not in an ellipse. Think of a football. It could be longer than it is wide or wider than it is tall. 
And this question is a little tricky because they're not giving you the equation in standard form. So I'll give you that formula we just saw before we start. Here's what we want the equation to look like. The equation of an ellipse centered at the origin is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And in that equation, the a represents your horizontal radius at the longest spot, and the b is your vertical radius at the longest spot. And notice that it equals 1. So I'll give you a second. See if you could finagle the given equation to look like the formula. Press pause. Give it a try. So remember, in the equation for an ellipse, you want it all to equal 1. Right now it equals 576. So we can manipulate this equation if we divide everything by 576. That would make it all equal 1. And then the fractions would reduce like this. The first one would give you x squared over 36 plus y squared over 16 equals 1. And now it's in standard form, and we could determine something about the a and the b. That denominator, the 36, is the a squared. That means a was 6. And then the 16 was the b squared. That means the b is 4. So your horizontal radius would have been 6, and your vertical radius would have been 4. And there's no h and k, which we'll get to in a moment. That means the center is the origin. Let's try another. Draw a rough sketch of this ellipse. So to give you a hand with this one, let's look at that second formula. And now we're going to have an ellipse that's not centered at the origin. The equation for that is x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. Now that equation is similar to the first one that we saw. Your a and your b are still in play as the horizontal and vertical radii, respectively. But now we have the h and the k. Those points represent the center. But because they're in parentheses, we have to negate them. That's a very important theme in the world of trigonometry. If something lives in parentheses, you negate it. So now that we know the formula, press pause and see what you can determine about this ellipse. And if you're feeling ambitious, try to sketch it out. I find it helpful to always start at the center. That way, you have a place to sketch the radii from. So let's look at that h and that k. With the 4 and the negative 1, we would negate those numbers. That means that the center would be negative 4, positive 1. Again, we have to change both of those values. So that gives us our center. And now, that denominator, the 36, is a squared. That means the a term itself was 6. So from the center, we'd be moving to the right 6 and to the left 6. And then the b squared, 9, means the b term was 3. That means you're going up 3 and down 3. So this would be your ellipse. So it's not so bad. You just need to know what the numbers mean. Again, these topics have really crept their way into the test, along with the other formulas I said before of the foci and the hyperbola. So take notes on any that you need. And whenever you come across other formulas that you don't know on a practice test, be sure to add them to your notes and flashcards. Now, just a side note on the SAT for a moment. Say what you will about that test, but they are far less likely to throw in random topics the way that the ACT does. Granted, once in a blue moon, they might. For example, the tests in the practice SAT book don't include any questions dealing with box and whisker plots, but in 2018, that topic suddenly started to appear on the SAT all the time. But for the SAT, this is a rarity. For the most part, the SAT is fairly consistent in terms of what topics are considered fair game. The ACT, not so much. So remember, those last few ACT math questions are going to be a little luck of the draw. There's no guarantee for what you'll see. That said, these are some of the topics that have crept their way into the test over the last few years. Odds are you'll see at least a few of them on your exam. So after you take the test, feel free to comment down below which of these topics you saw pop up on your exam. Or let us know what other random topics you saw that seem to come out of nowhere. It'll help your fellow students anticipate what they might see. And those random topics at the end might be the key to help you earn those last few elusive points. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.